Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's talk, How the French Saved America, Soldiers, Sailors, Diplomats, Louis the 16th, and the Success of a Revolution, presented by author Tom Chapman. Tom Chapman is the author or co-author of 40 books of nonfiction and fiction, and he's a documentarian whose work has been featured on ABC, CBS, NBC, and PBS, and on British, French, and German television. His most recent nonfiction books are a trilogy about the American Revolutionary Era, entitled How the French Saved America, Gentlemen, Scientists, and Revolutionary Heroes, and The Founding Fortunes. He's a life member of the Writers Guild of America, a former chairman of the board of the Writers Room in New York City, and a former trustee of the Connecticut Humanities Council. And as you know, tonight's talk is drawn from his book of the same title, and it's available for purchase at the Newport Historical Society's online museum shop, which is shopnewporthistory.com. Now, without any further delay, I'd like to present our speaker, Tom Shatman. And that's the title of my book, and it was published a few years ago by St. Martin, and I'm just still selling, and I'm very delighted with it. This is Carpenter's Hall in Philadelphia. I'd like you to imagine it on a very cold winter's night in the December of 1775, and several people are making their way through the street. Uh, they're going separately so that they're not seen together because they're gonna have a very clandestine meeting up there on the second floor, which is the home of the library company. One of them is Benjamin Franklin who founded the library company. Another one is his librarian. And the third one is John Jay, who's a member of his committee in, uh, in Congress. And the fourth one is the reason that they're there, a very mysterious guy called a Chevalier. And he is there because he is a semi-official envoy from the French government. Not official, mind you, but semi-official. And he's a very strange guy because John Jay thought he was in his 60s when he's actually only in his 20s. He's shriveled, he's bent up, and he's coming over just to meet with Franklin, not officially, but unofficially. The French wished the American rebels well. They'd be willing to have uh, American rebel ships come into their own ports to trade. And the third thing is that France really does not want Canada back. Now, the reason they don't want Canada back is irrelevant here. We think we know what it is today. But what this guy is conveying to Franklin is essentially the French are willing to do something with you, Americans. And this is rather extraordinary because the Americans have not yet declared independence. They are fighting against the British crown. The British crown and the French crown, which have been at odds for years, are nonetheless both monarchies. And so it's very difficult uh, for France to do anything for a former uh, colony of the British. Nonetheless, that's the message that's being conveyed. And uh, it's being conveyed by France. Now the next slide, please. This is the, the famous hall at Versailles where the French seat of government is at this time. This is now late 1775. The ruler is Louis the 16th. And here we see him in 1774 when he was just crowned. He just took the crown over a year ago and he's a very young man. And when I say young, I mean really young. He's married to Marie Antoinette, but they're both so young that they haven't yet figured out how to consummate the marriage. That's how young he is. And he's just taken over. And uh, he had fortunately, though, hired a very strong foreign minister. Next slide, please. This is the Comte de Vergennes. And he, this fellow was recommended to Louis XVI by Louis' father, who died 10 years earlier. And he left a list of very good guy, that eventually my son, you'll come into the throne and you'll need somebody to help you and to stay away from all these other people. And Vergens is one of them. Now Vergens at that point was on the verge of retirement. Uh, he thought his career was over when he gets called to come and take the, the highest foreign minister post in the land. And he and Louis XVI get together on a very deep Catholic level. They're both very devout Catholics. And they had a vision for France. France had been massacred in the war that ended in 1763, which is only 10 years before that. They decimated the, the army and the navy. And these need to come back up to 
to full speed before they can ever do anything about the always enemy, the perfidious Albion, that the British. But they can attack the British in another way by helping the American rebels. That will certainly, you know, tack down the British forces in North America and give the French time to, to build up and rebuild their forces. Uh, next slide, please. But they can't attack the British directly. They have to find a way to do it another, another way. And Vergen and Louis XVI get a little aid here from a man who's at court, who is Beaumarchais, Caron de Beaumarchais. He's been a music tutor to the, to the king and when he was young and to the king's sister. He's familiar at court. He's a playwright, he's a thief, he's a smuggler, he's a forger, uh, he's a foreign agent, all of these things, and a very, very smart guy. And to what he says was, look, you can't deal with the Americans directly because that will get the British to come after us. So we have to find a way to do it in another way. And what the Americans have for us, or want to sell to us, is their wonderful produce, which we need very much. We need rice, we need indigo, we need tobacco. We've been paying too much for it because it comes through Britain. Now we can get it easier. But, and we also have to get rid of a lot of stuff. Our old cannons, our old rifles, things like that, um, because we want to make new ones. So we'll do a trade. And I'll get in the middle of it, me, Beaumarchais. So you just let me do it and I'll do it. And the king and Bergen say, okay. And they start with this. And almost immediately thereafter, there arrives in France an American embassy. Next slide, please. And that man is Silas Dean. He's been sent there by Franklin and Robert Morris who are really running the Congress at that point. And he arrived just about the time in mid 1776 when the Declaration of Independence is being passed. Uh, he left the country before that was passed. And the existence of this Declaration of Independence is not even known in France when he arrived in July. Of he and Beaumarchais are put together very quickly and they make a wonderful team. And they decide that they're going to go and get a lot of boats and they're gonna put on these boats from France all sorts of cannon and other products that, and in exchange, the Americans will send their produce to Martinique and then the things will get switched around. And so the goods will go to, from Martinique back to US, which is not yet US, or just barely US, and the produce will come to France and it begins to work like a charm. And they're just getting started on this. They're finding eight, 10 different vessels that they're going to use uh, throughout the summer of 1776. But Franklin's getting nervous over there in America and so is Robert Mark because they don't really know what's going on. They're not that keen on Silas Dean after all, he was, he was much somewhat of a non-entity compared to them. So they decide that Franklin oh, too ought to go to France, see if we can get things hurried up. Next slide, please. There we have Benjamin Franklin who arrived in France in late 1776. Just as Washington is about to cross the Delaware, this wonderful mission across the Delaware, uh, we know that one where he goes and gets the Hessians and saves the army, American army essentially by having a victory when they need one. At around the same time, Benjamin Franklin is crossing a different Rubicon, which is the Seine River into Paris, where he's coming back and he's already a hero there. He's a scientist of great repute. He's been there, he's gotten many awards from him. Now he's going back. He actually expects to die there. He's an old man and he doesn't think he'll do it, but he has one great last mission to put together. And that's to bring France and, Amer and America together against Great Britain. And he's ready to do that. And Vergens welcomes him and he welcomes the whole delegation. And he says, let's have a party. Let's have a fete. Let's have a ball. Let's have a, a te dansant. In other words, let's enjoy ourselves because we're not ready to talk to you. And Franklin is sort of there, but he's put on the back burner for a whole year. 
he doesn't much mind because after all it is Paris, he might be able to find ways to enjoy himself. But meanwhile, the ships that France and America are putting together, Beaumarchais and Dean, with now with Franklin's help, are about to get to America. Next slide, please. And here's the one, the most important one. Uh, we don't know what it looks like because it was destroyed. We think it looks like this. It's the ship called the Amphitrite. And it was loaded with guns, especially cannon, and also things that we don't think that we really need, but we actually do if we're going to have an army in the field, such as spades and tent poles and fabric for the tents and shoes for the army people. This ship, the infantry, gets to Portsmouth, New Hampshire in the late spring of 1777. And it's a total revelation. The guy who brings it into the port gets word to Washington and basically says, they've got everything we need here. They have more cannon on this board ship than the whole American army has at the time. And Washington sends word to, to disperse all of this stuff to various depots so we can have it when we need it. And indeed, they very soon need it. Next slide, please. Over the summer of 1777, there are two very, very important battles. In the first of them, up at Saratoga, now what we see in this slide is a picture of um, Benedict Arnold becoming wounded in that battle. But the Battle of Saratoga was won by the Americans, and it was won in part because of French munitions, all those cannon that I spoke of, plus many um, rifles, plus a number of French officers uh, who took part in this. This was the most important battle of the early part of the American Revolution, and it was a win for the American. And it was made possible because of French munitions. Most of the bullets, for example, that were expended by the American in this battle came from France. It was, it was, it was that important. Next slide, please. At the same time that the Battle of Saratoga is going on, so run by Washington. And this is called the Battle of Brandywine Creek. And in this uh, famous painting, we see Washington with Lafayette, who, by the way, who was, was not quite 20 years old when this, uh, at the moment of this painting. And it shows the two of them together, uh, which, which is a little in advance of the reality, because at that point, Washington was not sure that he should travel, trust Lafayette, who had not been in battle before. And Washington had a very strong credo about who he was friendly with. And to get into Washington's good graces, you had to be battle tested and you had to be loyal and you had to, if possible, take one for the team. That means be injured in battle. And that's exactly what happened in the Battle of Brandywine. Lafayette, along with a number of other French officers, did a great job in preventing a total rout of the American forces. They, they were trained people from Europe. They'd been in battle, except for people like Lafayette, who were fairly young. Most of the others were older and had been in battle. And they prevented the rout of the American forces by going and positioning themselves, regathering the troops, directing them to, to retreat properly and all of that, and essentially saving most of the army. And, that, and Lafayette did exactly what Washington would have wanted him to. He got a wonderful bullet in his leg, blood is brimming into his, into his uh, boot, so much so that they'd have to almost take him off the, uh, uh, the horse with his, with his boots still on. And the guy that takes him off the horse just happens to be a French speaking American by the name of James Monroe, the future president. They became very close friends from here on. And Washington was so impressed with what Lafayette had done that he says to the surgeon, he said, treat him as if he were my son. Now, we know about the Battle of Brandywine and we know about the Battle of Saratoga, but I don't think you know maybe about the next battle that I'm going to talk about. Next slide, please. This is the Battle of Mud Island. Anybody ever hear of Mud Island? It takes place right after the Battle of Saratoga and Brandywine. What happened was that the British invested Philadelphia. They took over Philadelphia, which was the American capital. 
And as we know, the American troops were about to go to Valley Forge. But it's very, very important for the American cause to make sure that the river cannot bring British troops and British supplies in from the Atlantic Ocean. There are two forts, one on either side of the river, that have been set up expressly for this purpose. One is called Mud Island, and the other one is called Fort Mifflin. And to these forts, Washington sends the best people he has in America to take care of it. And the, both of them are French. They're French engineers. Now, engineer at that time did not mean somebody who built a bridge. It did mean built bridge building, but it was also mostly engineering that had to do with military engineering. And these were very experienced guys. Uh, Duplessis went to Fort Michelin and a man, uh, I'm sorry, name escaped me at the moment, De Fleury went to Mud Island. And they had jobs there that they knew very well as European fighters. That is, hold the fort, die if you have to, but prevent the enemy from getting there. And their task at this time was this very simple, hold the fort until the river began to ice over, which would prevent the British from having the ability to get supplies to their troops in Philadelphia. And it would allow the American army to escape to Valley Forge and to stay there. And as we know, that's exactly what happened. Washington was very, very happy with this. And uh, sometime later, um, next slide, please. Colonel Fleury got a medal. Of course, as we usually do it in the army, you don't get the medal for what you did. That was wonderful. You get the medal for something else that you did. It was probably somewhat irrelevant. And I think that tradition began with Colonel de Fleury's medal here, which he got with a wonderful battle named Stony Point. This is a fort on the Hudson, not far from where I am, uh, which was taken by sappers led by Colonel de Fleury and uh, uh, was a wonderful victory but almost absolutely meaningless one because two weeks after the fort was taken, the Americans abandoned it because it was strategically insignificant. However, there was a medal struck. Uh, the United States Congress at that point awarded Colonel de Fleury one of six medals uh, that it awarded during the entire Revolutionary War. They were like the Medal of Honor. And today, the the Colonel de Fleury Medal is, is still in existence. It is the chief medal given by the Army's Corps of Engineers. So he gets the medal for something that he was rather minor instead of for something he did that was rather major that we don't know very much about. Next slide, please. At Valley Forge, the French really came to the fore, and in particular, this one guy who was Louis de Portail, who was the chief engineer when Franklin got to Paris, uh, he specifically asked the king to send four engineers uh, to America. And the guy that they sent to lead the delegation was Louis de Portail, who had won all of their prizes, uh, who had begun to reorganize the, uh, the engineer corps. And Louis de Portail was a very smart guy. And he was also very smart in knowing how to talk to Washington. One of the chief things that people who are advisors to big guys know is that the most important thing that they can do is to prevent their chieftains from doing something stupid. And that's what happened here. The junior officers at Valley Forge, including people like Alexander Hamilton and even Lafayette, said what we want you to do is take the forces from Valley Forge and go rush into Philadelphia and try to take over Philadelphia from the army, from the British army that's there. And Louis de Porto wrote a memo to, to Washington saying, that would be about the stupidest thing you could possibly do because you could lose the army there. And your main job, Mr. General, is to keep that army intact. If you keep the army intact, the revolution will continue. If you lose the army, there it goes. And Washington said, you know, Louis, you're right. And thereafter, in every big deal that he did from then on, he always sent to find to know what does engineer Duportal have to say about it. Okay. 
Next slide, please. Around the time that Duportal and Washington are talking about what to do in Philadelphia from Valley Ford, things are finally loosening up across the water in Paris. And here we have a statue, it's actually a very small statue, tabletop, but it looks big, of Louis XVI and Franklin finally getting together and making treaties. And this happened after, as I say, a year of not happening. It happened very quickly in the early part of 1778. There are two treaties. One is a treaty of amity and friendship, and the other is a treaty of a sort of a secret treaty about what we're really going to do for one another. And this was rather fantastic stuff, because here you had France, one of the major powers in the world, saying that it would not rest until the United States of America had been granted a total independence from Great Britain. This is rather astonishing. And Louis and Vergen knew, and also Franklin knew, that as soon as this would happen, as soon as they found out about this, the British found out about this, they would, war would start and France would be involved in the war as well as America. And Louis XVI and Vergen said, we want to let them start the war. We don't want to start the war. So we're going to put this treaty into effect and I'm going to send a fleet over to America and we're going to give you some money and the rest of that stuff. But let's not talk about it. Franklin says, okay. And they do so. And things start nosing around. The British start beginning to find out that this might be happening and everything. And fleets begin to engage. Next slide, please. And those fleets finally meet in around July of 1778. And it's a small engagement, four ships on the British side, four ships on the French side. And eventually they go mano a mano, one on one. Several of the British ships run away. One of the British ships uh, prevails over another one. But the last ship, uh, French ship, the Belle Poule, manages to vanquish its opponent and then send word to Versailles that it has won the first battle of the war and now war is declared on both sides. And at Versailles, they decide they'll hold a party. And one of the things that happened was that one of the women had a coiffure made of the Belle Poule. So she had it, shall we say, in the rigging. Next slide, please. By around this time, when that's happening overseas, the Belle Poule is engaged and the war is starting. By that point, the Admiral d'Estaing has arrived in America. Now, he was not the best admiral in the French fleet, but he was the one who was closest to Louis XVI. Not closest in age or closest in blood, but he had cozied up and his wife had cozied up to Mary Antoinette. And so he was the most with it admiral available. As I say, not the best one there, but he sent to America. And this is a cartoon of what uh, Americans hoped would happen, which that the Stang would arrive there and the British would just be blown up or blown out of the water. And it, as you know, because you're in Newport, this didn't happen. First thing that happened was that the Stang shows up at Philadelphia and he said, you know, go upstream. He, he with his mere appearance in Philadelphia, did chase the British out because they didn't want to have a fight. So then he goes to try and and beard them in their den in New York. But the New York Harbor is blocked up and it would be like a line of fire to try and take his ships in. So he waits for the right tide to come along and he waits for 10 days and he went for more. And finally he decides with Washington that they shouldn't do that because it's too dangerous. So that they wanna go and go to a secondary target that they think will be a lot easier. Next slide, please. And that target, as you know, is where you're sitting now in Newport. Now this portion of the lecture, you guys probably know a lot more about than I do, but I'll give it to you in my caption. Uh, Newport was extremely well defended. The British knew what they were doing. They had a fleet there and they also had a garrison there. It was very easy for them 
to retrieve their troops, bring them in back of the garrison, and stand off anything that was coming. By contrast, the French fleet and the American soldiers and the Americans that were there and a few American ships were a total mess. First of all, the French and the Americans weren't speaking very well together, despite the presence of people like Lafayette and others who, who spoke both French and English very well. It was not really a matter of translation, it was a matter of ego. The Stang had an ego, the American commander had an ego, and nobody was really trying very hard to get along. And the result was a total mess. Finally, when the Americans and French were ready to attack, uh, the British fleet arrived and the French fleet arrived together, British fleet from New York, and they decide that the, they're not gonna fight in the harbor. It was a no-no to fight in harbor, so that they were gonna take themselves out to sea and have a battle. And they get ready to have this tremendous battle on which the fate of Newport will rest. And a hurricane comes along and blows both fleets to smithereens. The French and American troops never quite get into the bastion of Newport. It is a total disaster. After this, Destang takes his fleet up to Boston to retrofit and then down to the Caribbean. Early in the next year, he did, he's over at Savannah, another disaster there, and he limps on his way home. By the time he gets there, there's somebody else there from America. Next slide, please. And that is Lafayette, seen here on the left, talking to Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. Lafayette's been sent by Washington and also by his own uh, fiat because he has a very big message. Now, when Lafayette left for America, he was 19 years old and he was a fugitive. There was a price on his head. He escaped. Uh, he, he was not supposed to be there. But now when he comes back several years later, he's not only a man of the world, but he's a hero to the world. He's been sending letters home, which his wife has publicized. And he's a big hero all over Europe. He's the man who's leading the revolution, as far as the French are concerned, in America with Washington, with whom they think is terrific because he's beating the British. So Lafayette now has the standing to say to the king and to the queen, sire, enough with the small stuff. You sent this thing, but that was just a very small fort, and he wasn't your best admiral. You have to think big. We have a quarter of a million people under arm. We have many, many ships. Now, I know you have to fight in the Caribbean, and I know you have to fight in the Mediterranean, and you have to have you know, ships stand in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the English Channel, but we must send to America a force commensurate with being in a big war with them. Because if America goes under, then America and Great Britain will get together and they'll come after us. So to prevent all that, you must send a big force to America. And I have just the guy who's the right person to lead it. Wow. Now, Louis says, OK, I understand. I agree. Uh, but I really think that we need to put this force uh, under someone else who's much more experienced in battle. And you are invaluable in being an interlocutor with Washington. So please go back and help Washington. And meanwhile, we'll send someone else. Next slide, please. And that man, of course, is to Comte de Rochambeau, who's seen here in full battle dress. And Rochambeau and Washington were very interesting people together. They had started out at about the same height, somewhere around 6'3". But Rochambeau, although he sees here in this portrait to be erect and everything, was actually bent over and stooped because of all the wounds that he had. But, but they were very similar types of guys. All they wanted to talk about was war, how to fight war, what to do. If you left them together, they take out the snuff boxes, put it on a barrel, and move them around to show how you're moving forces around. 
So they were people who were inherently respectful of one another because they were very similar. And Rochambeau arrives in Newport, of course, on when? On July 4th, 1780. Next slide, please. And here we have supposedly an engraving of Rochambeau arriving in Newport. I'm a little leery of the veracity of this engraving because he's on a white horse. And the fact was that the French were forced to leave their horses at the pier because they took up too much room in the boat. So I don't know where he got this white horse from. Maybe it swam out to meet him in the boat. I don't know, anyway. So one, they had a wonderful reception. Rochambeau could not have been more enthusiastic about his reception there in America and especially in Newport. And he had learned the lessons of Destin and the lessons were what not to do. Don't do the wrong thing. So he did everything right. He held parade, he fed people, and he held Te Dansant, he did all sorts of stuff that was good. The one thing he didn't do was give in to Washington. Washington came over, he said, oh, I'm so glad you're here. Let's go fight. We have to retake New York because New York is absolutely the only place where if we retake it, we can end the war. And Rosenthal said, well, not, not so fast, really, you know, I have a quarter of my men who are laid up like by the voyage. Some of the ships are damaged. Um, we really don't have enough ships uh, or enough equipment or anything. And there's not enough time to get over to New York City, mount a full thing uh, this year. So, so we need to put it off. Well, Washington really had no choice in the matter, except for the fact that he's out of money. The people are deserting. They're, they're beginning to leave him behind. And he can't do much, but the winter of 1780 in the early spring, 1781 was an absolute terrible time for the American forces because they're their fabulous allies sitting in Newport having too much of a good time while they're starving and they can't do much about it. However, the year begins to pass, the spring begins to thaw, Washington forces are still there and he's moved them over to the Hudson River. And he finally convinces Rochambeau to move his forces as well. But they're waiting to hear from a very important guy. And that is the Admiral de Grasse. Next slide, please. Admiral de Grasse has been sent with a huge force from Paris, but he has to go first to the Caribbean because he's got to make a deal with the Spanish. In the Caribbean, he makes this deal with the Spanish. Okay, Spanish, you are now allied with France and America, and you watch over all of the French and Spanish possessions in the Caribbean, keep them from the British. And meanwhile, we'll be able to go up and fight somewhere on the North American continent. And de Grasse makes the decision that he does not want to go to New York. What he wants to do is he wants to go to Yorktown. There's an army there. He figured that the fleet will be able to surround Yorktown, which is on a peninsula, and that they'll be able to take that and that that will end the war. And so he sends a letter of this, about this intent, to Newport, where Admiral Barris is. He thinks that Rochambeau is there. He's not. Rochambeau has moved over to meet with the armies with Washington on the Hudson. And so the letter is then sent up to Washington and to Rochambeau. And immediately Washington has to give up this dream that he's had for five years of going to attack New York. He has to go to York then. But now he and Rochambeau have a problem. How are they going to get the British in New York City fooled so that the British don't get to Yorktown ahead of them? Because the British have a fleet in New York that can take all of their troops down to Yorktown, and they could have a battle royal there, and they could beat both the French and the American armies. So they have to figure out a way to trick the British into staying in New York while they get down towards Yorktown. And to do this, they bring out a new and improved weapon of war. Next slide, please. French bread. 
This is what I call the French bread connection. I'm sorry if you don't believe me, but I'll tell you the story. Here's what happened. Rochambeau and Washington cook up this wonderful scheme, mostly Rochambeau, I think, because they had noticed when the British come raiding, what they want first is to take the bread right out of the ovens. So they find a town that's 25 miles west to west of Staten Island and New York. And they decide to send out the commissaries along the Raritan River, which is near there, to buy up all of the spare bricks and to do this in full sight of the British who are around there. And then they take all of those bricks and in this town 25 miles to the west of New York, they build a bakery, an oven, a set of ovens, 16,000 loaves a day they're producing. And the, the American and French troop move down to this town, which is, as I say, just due west of New York. So the British who are watching cannot be sure what's going on. Are they going to attack us coming west? And they say, well, wait a minute, you know, is it a permanent installation in that town or is it a temporary one? Well, it's not going to be a temporary one if you build ovens to bake your bread, right? So the aroma of French bread wafts over. Washington sends a whole troop of people to, to guard these ovens. It, it was a wonderful ruse and it worked like a charm. The British did not believe that the Americans were and the French were coursing south as quickly as they could on foot. And they got to Philadelphia before the British even knew that they were gone from upper New Jersey. In Philadelphia, they actually had a crisis because the troops wanted a mutiny and only because the French had brought a lot of money with them, which was now distributed to the American troops, were those troops willing to go further down and down into Yorktown. Next slide, please. The Yorktown battle, which we all think of as taking place on land, actually was decided at sea. And uh, the admirals who were involved, uh, de Grasse, and also the Admiral Barrett coming down from Newport were the keys to this. For three days, they kept the British at sea. And while uh, de Grasse is keeping the British occupied, and they're having a tremendous, wonderful fight there, de Barrett does something very interesting. He goes down to from Newport to Yorktown by a very interesting and unusual route. He goes around Long Island, directly south, and then he gets opposite to, New to, uh, um, to Yorktown, and he goes directly west. And he was, by doing this, he goes in back of this battle that's being held, and he gl glides into the harbor at Yorktown before the British can get back in. And he effectually, seals them off. That, this gives the Americans and the French time to get down there. Next slide, please. And they, they take up the cannons. And these cannons now include both the cannons that had been brought over by um, de Grasse and actually also by Barris. They were some of the things that were in those ships from Newport, the new cannon and the old one that they had previously sold to the American that had been brought down from Saratoga and, and all of those other places. And they set up a siege. And the guy who knows the most about sieges, probably the most in the world, is, Ro is Rochambeau. So they set up a siege with Rochambeau in charge. And one of the, the funny, interesting parts of it is they had to have a password for the Americans. And they decided the password would be Rochambeau. But the Americans, who really didn't speak French, heard it as, rush on, boys. And they thought this was a great password. And it worked like a charm. The siege worked very well. Cornwallis and his troops were effectively starved into cooperation. And so, next slide, please. It was started by things, and the French and the Americans did everything together. If Washington lit a, lit a cannon, then next uh, Rochambeau would light a cannon. And it went like that, you know, all together. And it was perfect coordination. Next slide, please. It was such perfect coordination that 
Washington would later say to Congress and anybody who would listen that Rochambeau and de Grasse were his co-adjutors of Yorktown, the co-victors, the ones who made it possible, and which was eventually commemorated in, in a stamp issued 150 years after Yorktown. It was a tremendous victory, and people understood at the time, or well, much less now, that this was a joint American and French victory, which would absolutely not have been able to occur without the French troops and the French fleet and the French money. So next slide, please. So when it finally gets to the point where they're going to draw up treaty to end the war, the war ended with the Battle of Yorktown, one said in 1781, but the treaty didn't get to happening until 1783, a tremendous unsettled time during that time. And Benjamin West, who was a protege of Franklin, decided that when they finally sat all together to um, agitate the treaties, the British and the American, uh, he was going to draw a portrait of them. And this unfinished portrait occurred because the British, who said they were going to sit down with them in the first place for the portrait, eventually didn't. And it's sort of emblematic of what happened in those negotiations. Both the British and the French turned on the Americans as if they were in cahoots rather than the enemy that they were supposed to be, and tried as hard as possible to restrict the United States to a small corridor on the eastern shore. And it was only by astute work by Franklin and by, by John Adams and uh, to, to get, it, and John Jay, to, to make it possible for America to exist today. Well, that was the end of a very beautiful French friendship. And that's the end of my lecture today. I've, I've left out an awful lot, so I can condense it into the time frame. But thank you very much for listening. Happy to take some questions if there are any. Uh, so Kathleen asks if you could share your thoughts on the French language in the U.S. There were a number of French people here, and uh, French was the, the language of culture other than English, so there were a number of people who, who uh, studied it, mostly not too well unless they had a native French tutor. Um, there, were, there were jokes in Paris about the accent of, uh, of Franklin and especially of John Adams, whose, uh, whose French was school taught, but it was hardly understandable. So. Um, there did come to be a much larger French present. Uh, some of that was already uh, in Savannah and uh, in other, in other uh, cities of the South where French Huguenot uh, had been there for several generations. And um, she also asked about um, the French language and the French culture. Uh, she asked then and now, so uh, particularly, you know, the 18th century and how um, the French culture would have been um, known, I guess, amongst the colonists, and then well, how I, it would have been received amongst anyone who wasn't familiar with it. The <laughs> models were, were generally uh, British models. Uh, we had not yet understood how much of culture was French or could be French. Uh, and partly that was because the British had interfered. It was difficult to import French painting or French furniture or even a French brocade or things like that because everything in it could have, you could get something from France, but before the revolution, it had to go first through Britain. So it was tremendously expensive and not ordinary. And one of the great things that happened as a result of the revolution was to make direct contact between France and America, not only possible, but a good thing, something that, that people wanted to participate in. Uh, Ralph asks, how did the French help to build West Point? Well, actually, Louis de Portail uh, uh, made the first curriculum for West Point, and a number of the French engineers uh, did end up uh, teaching there or, or designing courses to go there. And it was very much set up as a school on the model of, of the French military engineering schools. And uh, Richard asks, has the significance of the French in our revolution been purposely minimized? I don't think so. Uh, it was sort of uh, it, it, it sort of attenuated, um, but it would by the by the hundredth anniversary of Yorktown, um, it was very much not known, and uh, 
even in World War I, um, there, were, there was a sense that America was finally coming, you know, Lafayette, we are here, was the slogan of the American troops, that they were, they were coming to deliver uh, something that, that needed to be delivered. The problem was, not then, the problem was in the latter part of the Washington administration and going on into the John Adams administration, when there was what we call a quasi-war with France, because France had been taken over by the revolutionary forces there, and they were trying to do everything opposite to what King Louis XVI had done, and that included pressing America for payment, repayment of loan that America was really not too happy to do and very happy to get out of. So it began at that time to sort of try and get out from under the idea of, of French, Franco-American friendship. Uh, had Washington survived past his death date, uh, he probably would not have allowed that because he had been, was convinced to the end of his life that, that French was absolutely integral to, uh, to America's thing. Uh, there was also a sense during the Civil War uh, that France uh, really wanted to side with the South because they were, uh, they, they had a lot to do with, with the Southern uh, cotton trade. Jack asks, uh, did any of the French military officers lose their heads during the French Revolution? Yes. Um, it's often said that the American Revolution was the model for the French Revolution. But when you look at who had served in America and then went back over to France, it was divided almost 50-50 by people who became rebels in France and people who were on the side of the king. So um, yes, there were people who eventually did lose their lives because they were in that half of the people who sided with uh, with the king and, and the royalist forces. Uh, so not many, but uh, there were also not many on the other side. Um, in, in fact, the American Revolution, in terms of the people who had fought in America, didn't have much to do with, with how things went in France, except perhaps maybe for Lafayette, who was sort of permanently uh, semi-American. Uh, Kathleen asks, how can we make the French role in our history better known? Well, you can shout about it. Um, <laughs> you can sign my book, I suppose. But uh, it's, it's really there. It's not something that we need to be ashamed of. Uh, it's actually something that's rather quite wonderful. Uh, you know, uh, the, the American Declaration of Independence, for example, became a model all over the world, especially in France and from France throughout Europe. Um, it, it, was, it was just a marvel. And, and you know, for time, there was, just, there was a tremendous sense of reciprocity, of understanding what the French had done for us. But you know, we Americans like to think we do everything by ourselves and for ourselves. We don't need anybody else. Well, this is just kind of an interesting way of teaching children that you know, we do need allies. We do need to interact with the rest of the world. And we have done so since the beginning of the world.